to introduce Francis Carey, our next speaker, who is an architect from Burkina Faso, founded the non-profit association Schulbaustein of Jorgando in 98 and then founded his own architecture studio in Berlin in 2005. I became aware of his work for the first time through my late friend Christoph Schlingensief, who told me about the amazing school they uh, built together in, uh, in Africa. And actually, this school has a lot to do with many things we discussed over the last two days, because um, Cedric and Lucius both developed these amazing you know, models for experimental schools, uh, the pottery think belt, and then Lucius, the, his famous canapé. And it would be great to hear from Francis more about this. He's also most recently exhibited at the Sensing Spaces exhibition at the Royal Academy, um, where he developed an amazing uh, participatory work. Um, so that will lead us to some other questions related also to participations, which are so prominent in both Burkhardt's work and also in the work of uh, Cedric Price. Please give a very, very warm welcome to Francis Kere. Now, Francis, to begin with the beginning, I wanted to ask you to tell us about this first project of yours. I, I got to know through so Christoph which is the school, it was exhibited recently in Munich, in the Pinakothek, uh, and it's a collaboration between uh, you and Christoph Schlingensief. And Christoph Schlingensief, for those of you, Christoph, uh, is a great inspiration for many of us here, for Tino and, and me, and for Utopia Station also. Actually, when we did in 2003 Utopia Station, Christoph had his Church of Fia. How, how did you get to meet Christoph? <clears throat> Um, first of all, I would like to say thank you for coming. Um, I would love to show you some uh, slides, but uh, I was confused in this uh, water city, so <laughs> I couldn't find my stuff. So thank you for coming and uh, thank you for inviting me. Um, so how I did meet Christoph? Um, I was in, uh, in uh, South Africa. I was giving a, a conference and somebody talked about um, a German artist that was looking for an architect to build a, an opera, uh, to build an opera in Africa. And so, if you know my work, if you know what I'm doing, if you know how hard it is to collect money and go and build a school, and suddenly you met somebody that said he's going to build an opera, you know what kind of uh, reaction I had. So I just met this, I was shocked that somebody was looking to build an opera in a place where more than 90% of the, pe the people are neither able to read nor write. So that is how I met him. And I refused to meet him. Um, different to you that knows him. And so later I happened to meet him and he was that kind of energy that we architect, uh, we, we should have. It was like, a, like he was coming from a pot of drag. He's speaking, 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 speaking about Africa, speaking about the world, speaking about art, asking me about a lot of artists that I don't know. And I had to say, yes, you are a great guy. Let's work together. <laughs> so that's how we met. Uh, wonderful, your, your homage to Christoph. And it's, I think it's super important in the context here of the Swiss Pavilion that we do remember Christoph's energy. Uh, can you tell us what you then exactly did, what you built for? Because I saw it also in the current retrospective at MoMA PS1. There are some, you know, yeah. schemes and some photographs. Um, so we have to say that I've been working since 98 on different projects, uh, on community, community participative projects, developing ideas, mainly building schools and nurseries. And then he came with the, this idea that we turn to an opera village. An opera village meaning, um, according to him later, that and a social plastic. A social plastic that the, the people should build their own village themselves and the heart of this uh, structure will be an opera. That was his idea. And he was really referring to Boyce, Joseph Boyce, uh, that is the father of social plastic. Um, that is it. So we build it. We're still building it, and that is the project. And uh, is it, so it basically never stops. It goes on and on and on. Yeah, this idea is a process. It will grow like a, um, 
uh, sp spiral. Yeah. So it never ends, it's growing and growing according to how much uh, need is there and then also the money and the energy to keep pushing that project. Now this whole idea of participation is in your work in general uh, and uh, it's something as we could see this morning uh, with Bernard Lassus you know, describing the, the gardens and is extremely present in Lucius Burkhardt's work. The idea of participation is of course at the core even of the Farm Palace of Cedric Price. Where did, where did it come from for you in your work? How did you come to such participatory <coughs> models of, of architecture? What, what were your inspirations? Well, um, just to be really honest, um, in Burkina Faso or Africa, uh, you have three problems. So let me say three. It's my theory. Uh, don't look at it in a book. Um, first, we have a lot of people and they need to be educated. So we're lacking of technicians. So, and then money. And then, third, we have the climate, a very strong climate. The idea I had is to work with the people to try to find a way how we could build together a, um, a school or um, um, a hill cash center or even housing. So to develop a model that the entire village or the community can be part of it. This is the, the work uh, I am doing. So simply, uh, it was born of sheer necessity. There is no money, there is no technician, but we have something the most. A clay is, is available and it costs nothing. I just needed to train the people how to take it, just transform it to make it modern, and then to, to use it to create architecture. This is what we do. More, not more, not less. And were there any, so it came out of a practice. It didn't come out of any influence from any architect. So it came out of a daily practice. Or? Oh yes, we can say that. I would love to, but uh, there was no time I started to build when I was a student. Um, and you have to know that I'm still missing a lot of stuff in education. Uh, when I was studying, uh, some friends or the school just went to places like Versailles uh, to see this big castle uh, or to go to, to New York to visit all of these amazing buildings. But I couldn't afford to go there. I was concentrated looking for ideas how I can bring that what I have learned in the Western world, what I have learned in Berlin, what I have learned in Germany to bring it to Burkina Faso. So that is it, simply because uh, uh, but I don't have the time to study people. There is no time. And I, to be honest, it didn't happen pe to me to sit and have a book and start to read. There is no way. I am on building site, pushing, working, looking for alternative, coming back to the Western world, trying to be in a place like that. So it is really amazing, but you know, to be, come from Burkina to meet, uh, it has to be something for me. Uh, so I, I miss a lot of ex uh, uh, experience that I will gain talking to people like him, like you, or reading even. But I concentrate myself on doing, maybe in 30 years I will have the time to read and we can talk more. <laughs> So the work really is grown out of urgency and that, you know, since the beginning. In 2001, you, you did the primary school in Gando, so that was your, your first project. Can you tell us about this? Uh, and I kind uh, of like the idea that you lost your images because that's very Cedric Price. Yeah. Whenever we invited Cedric Price to do a lecture, something went wrong with the images. In Helsinki, I think they, <laughs> as Dominic Gonzalez first said the other day, they fell down and he didn't find them anymore. So it's very Cedric. But can you tell us about that, about that school, the primary school in, in Gando? It's an honor to, to compare me with this great guy. Thank you very much. <laughs> um, so the, the primary school was very simple. Um, um, when I, I was a kid, I couldn't attend education because there was no school in my village. And imagine I come to your society and I discover techniques how to make buildings uh, uh, bigger. So I just went back. Uh, as a student, I have to say, uh, to build a school with the community. That is how it started. So it's no mystery inside. It's just uh, I, had a, I had a big, big heart for my community. And I had to go back and try to give them something. So that's what I, I did. Very simple. Now, the last question, maybe the last complex sort of about rituals, because we've heard many vignettes uh, here over the last two days from Dorothea von Hantelmann, and it's kind of fascinating. It's the first time, I think, in my, in my experience since I curate shows that that happens, that we actually produce reality and do an exhibition and have the choreography of a show activated at the same time a marathon, and then, on top of it all, as another layer, 
a theoretician, Dorothea von Hantemann, permanently writing a book and writing the theory accompanying what's happening here. And Dorothea told us a lot about this ritual, the exhibition as a ritual. And I was kind of very interested if you can tell us a little bit more, a little bit about this, because I saw your work at the, at the Royal Academy, yeah. Sensing Spaces, yeah. and it was hugely fascinating because it was extremely participatory. It was really the visitor who made the architecture. Yeah. Uh, there was a fun palace feeling to it uh, uh, in that sense, and it was also a ritual. Can you tell us about the piece you did for Sensing Spaces and to which extent it is a kind of a public ritual and how you involve the mm -hmm. viewer? Um, so the Sensing Space exhibition was a, a big challenge for me, but a great, great experience. I got the chance to work with the powerful um, uh, curator, Kate Godwin, uh, who just asked me to try to do something in London, um, um, how to, to, to express architecture in a different way in a Royal Academy. And so, as you know my work, I'm trying um, as possible as, so to integrate local material to integrate the power of people. Um, it is always the process. And in London, London is a, a Great Britain is the, one of the leading industrial nation in the world, in history, whatever. And uh, you have a honey camp in London and straws. And I just had an idea to create a frame and to invite the visitor that normally are standing before the picture, are not allowed to touch, so because it's uh, the Royal Academy, and now I wanted them to be active. So this was simply the project we had there, and so I am happy the curator didn't cut my head, she didn't kill me because it seemed to be a success, and I'm happy about it. That is what we did. And can you tell us more about how it exactly worked? Because the visitor could take these elements yeah. and... We had, and a, yeah. Yeah. We had a, a pot of straw. Uh, uh, we wanted to ask the people to bring their straw from home and just put in the honey cam structure. Uh, at, by the end, we, had, uh, we helped a little bit. We had some pot full of them, and the people has to interact. So it's an, it's an, 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 an amazing show, you have to see it. So it was like white, very perfect, and suddenly it started to grow, and grow, and grow, and it became something different than at the beginning. So uh, it has evolved through the participation of the people. That is what we wanted to achieve, very simply. We wanted from the passive visitor to have an active uh, art creator. That is what we wanted to do. And uh, Kate wanted me to go that way. There could not be a more... And she, Kate Goldwyn is here. I saw her. <laughs> so it's the lady in, uh, in uh, blue. So, okay, ciao. <laughs> there could not be a more wonderful conclusion, Francis. Thank you very, very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.